Let's go. All right. Uh, hi there. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, Dr. Adam Ostendorf, and this is Dr. David Millett, and we're going to be talking to you today about myths and misconceptions about epilepsy surgery. So I'm going to start with a story. So this is Tanya. Tanya is 20 years old, and she has spastic quadriplegia. Um, she's had daily seizures since age of two years, uh, multiple seizures a day, typically big full body tonic seizures. And at the time I met her, she was taking four anti-seizure medicines and had tried eight others. And when I met her in the ICU, uh, she was admitted for status epilepticus or prolonged seizures. Um, you know, and I had looked through her chart, I was surprised that she had never been considered for epilepsy surgery and um, the family had never uh, sought an opinion about epilepsy surgery. And uh, this, you know, begs the question, is there something better for Tanya, who had been through many years of her life on anti-seizure medicine and still having lots of seizures, and what about surgery? And it's important to take a step back and say, well, what are the facts? Why would surgery have been a good idea for Tanya? And it's important to remember um, these things. So epilepsy surgery, uh, according to the AAN and the ILAE and many, many other folks, and I'm sure you've heard this uh, because of the theme here at um, Epilepsy Awareness Day, that epilepsy surgery should be considered in people with drug-resistant epilepsy. So people who have tried two anti-seizure medicines and continue to have seizures. Epilepsy surgery is safe. There's less than 1% risk of death now in the United States. And complication rates vary at, based on the surgery type. So uh, minimally invasive surgeries have a lower complication rate than larger open resections. But in general, the epilepsy surgery complication rate is, is acceptable. And epilepsy surgery is very effective. So um, there have been a few randomized controlled trials out there. In adults, 58% um, of patients were seizure-free versus 8% on medicine alone. Uh, and in children, 77% uh, were seizure-free versus 7% on medicine alone. So we know that surgery should be considered in everybody like Tanya. We know that epilepsy surgery can be safe, and we know that it's very effective in some people. So why in the world do some people never hear about epilepsy surgery despite having bad seizures? Well. As the title of the talk goes, there are myths and misconceptions. So how do these myths hurt people? They hurt people because doctors hear or believe myths and have misconceptions and don't offer the best treatments or tests. And patients and families um, avoid something that may make them better. And why does it matter? Because the patients continue to have seizures and we wanna get rid of seizures. We wanna minimize their impact on quality of life. These patients have more injuries, have lower quality of life scores, and have a higher risk for sudden death in epilepsy. And the Institute of Medicine agrees, and they say that in the United States, where we have a lot of healthcare resources, 95% of people who may benefit from epilepsy don't have access. And that treatment gap is, is um, astounding in a place we should do better. So I'm going to briefly talk about some of the myths and misconceptions that doctors have and how they impact how we practice. And then my partner is going to talk about the patient and family realm. So providers are variable, right? We have epileptologists, we have neurologists, we have advanced practice providers, we have general um, practitioners like family practice doctors, internal medicine doctors. Uh, pediatrician. So we have all these different providers. Doctors are not all the same. Um, but most of the time, the folks who are going to be talking about epilepsy surgery are making those referrals or neurologists. And one of the, I think, um, a striking uh, figure in that when neurologists here in the United States were surveyed, and they were given a lot of different options as far as what to pick for what is drug-resistant epilepsy. Only 14% of the doctors surveyed could, and these were neurologists, 
only 14% of the neurologists could say drug-resistant epilepsy is continued seizures after trying two appropriately chosen anti-seizure medicines. So you can imagine that a large barrier to care is this myth or misconception that you either have to fail all of the medicines or you have to fail three medicines or you have to have continued seizures that are convulsive seizures. All of the answers in that questionnaire were um, focused on myths or misconceptions of the actual definition of the diagnosis. Um, and then furthermore, you know, doctors don't all know the same outcomes, right? If you were to ask me, a, an epilepto pediatric epileptologist, what are the outcomes for uh, the, you know, new injectables for migraine, I would really stumble with that because that's not at all in my wheelhouse. But I would know who to ask, and I would turn to one of my partners and I would ask them a question. And unfortunately, the flip isn't always done where a neurologist may not know the question or the answer to the question of, is there a good treatment option, surgery, what does surgery look like? Um, but they, they um, don't uh, choose to refer or don't make a recommendation to refer. Um, and so that leads to something called premature closure bias or selection bias. There's a lot of other names for the types of bias that get in the way. But <clears throat> those, that provider may then say, uh, you know, it's, you're not a good candidate for surgery, even though they may not have done all the testing or recommended any testing at that point. And in fact, one study, um, f uh, about one-fifth of families and patients who had drug-resistant epilepsy were discouraged from having surgery by their neurologist. So their neurologist said, eh, surgery is not for you, even before doing the, the, any kind of testing or referral. So that may close the door. And that's primarily because we can't all keep up to date on everything. You know, 45% were unaware of surgery guidelines. They um, said that surgery shouldn't be considered based on an underlying etiology, say genetic. And we know that is not the case um, uh, as newer data are coming out about some genetic etiologies are very responsive to surgery. Um, also, epilepsy type. Generalized epilepsy used to be a closed door for proceeding down an epilepsy surgery road, and now there are newer options and also better tests to determine if it's truly generalized or not. Another very valid reason uh, is for, that neurologists don't refer on for consideration of epilepsy surgery is that we don't always communicate very well. Right? I work at a level four epilepsy center um, where we get referrals from other folks and I fully admit we do not do nearly as good a job as we should in communicating back to those referring providers about what we're doing, what our thoughts are. So we have a lot of work to do on the doctor side on trying to get rid of these myths and misconceptions and how to then close the treatment gap in epilepsy surgery. And now I'm going to turn, turn it over to my partner about uh, patients and families. Thank you, Adam. Did that advance? <laughs> or did I kill it? There we go. So um, I'm going to pick up with um, uh, sort of parent and some of the family views um, and uh, try to dispel some of the myths and misconceptions um, that uh, have persisted in the community for uh, quite a number of years since really the dawn of epilepsy surgery in the mid 20th century. So historically, epilepsy surgery has been thought of as a treatment intervention of last resort. And um, historically, drug-resistant epilepsy or pharmaco or intractable epilepsy, the, the term that was used for many, many years to describe patients who were potential surgical candidates was intractable epilepsy, which essentially means that you've tried anything and everything under the sun to control seizures medically before you think of even sending a patient off for epilepsy uh, surgery evaluation. Um, and there's been a number of studies that have shown that that's actually not in the patient's best interest. 
and the landmark study was published around 2000, which was a paper um, that came out of Glasgow um, by authors named Quan and Brody that identified a drug-resistant epilepsy is failure of two medications. And at that point in time, once the second medication has been tried and failed, um, patients really should be um, sent on for a surgical uh, evaluation. Um, so, so understanding um, the disease uh, as being something that can be treated equally with surgery um, or medication once patients have been found to be drug resistant um, is really an important, uh, really an important step in the um, evolution of thinking about treatment options. Um, next, just wanted to touch a little bit about um, the estimation um, of the risks of epilepsy surgery. So the, the um, one of the misconceptions is that um, there is a significant chance of either dying or having a permanent disability related to epilepsy surgery. And this is just simply not the case. Um, as the slide here indicates, there's a very, very um, uh, uh, slim chance of mortality in the setting of, of epilepsy surgery. And in fact, in larger studies, um, when the medical arm and the surgical arm were compared over time, um, in both the adult and the pediatric um, populations, it's the medical arm in which more patients died compared to the surgical arm. Surgery saves lives of patients with drug-resistant epilepsy. Complication rates are low, um, and in the changing landscape of epilepsy surgery, um, there are now a number of different procedures, and it's difficult to, I, I can't, um, I don't think either one of us could give a single percentage of complication rate for main, major or minor um, complications for uh, um, epilepsy surgery in general, because there are so many different options right now, and the pendulum is definitely swinging towards a more minimally invasive approach that has significantly fewer um, risks associated with them. The last point on this slide is, uh, again, the, the underestimation of risks of intractable seizures uh, w in which patients and their families and their neurologists are trying to manage seizures as best they can with, met with the medications they're on. Um, those, uh, those patients tend to do worse in terms of mortality and morbidity over time. Um, so oftentimes, where are the sources of information or misinformation? It's oftentimes friends, family members, um, somebody that they happen to meet at church or at school who had a bad experience um, or is distrustful of uh, surgeons in the medical community. Um, as you can say, see, um, many patients are um, discouraged from pursuing uh, a surgical evaluation even by their providers. 22% discouraged by a healthcare provider and two-thirds of the time it's their community neurologist, um, typically not somebody working in an epilepsy center uh, who is discouraging them from, um, from pursuing a surgical evaluation. Um, the risks are real, but they're exaggerated uh, most of the time. When you ask uh, 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 communities or individuals um, who are not physicians, not in the medical uh, profession, what, what would you estimate on a scale of 1 to 10 being the risks of brain surgery? The, the, the average is 8.3, which is a fairly serious, um, pretty high uh, degree of dangerousness of a, of a, of a medical or surgical procedure. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this number before, um, before this presentation. Um, half of patients, even if they, were, if, they, if they were told that their procedure they were going to undergo um, was guaranteed to stop their seizures, um, half of them would not even consider a surgical uh, treatment in that setting, which is sort of a remarkable um, statistic given the risks of uncontrolled uh, epileptic seizures. So we really have to balance the risks and benefits as we, with epilepsy surgery as we do with any other um, intervention. Uh, I've mentioned uh, these uh, statistics. So um, on the pediatric side, 10-year survival when um, uh, children that, were, that underwent epilepsy surgery 
um, either resective or ablative surgery with a laser device um, versus VNS versus medication alone. As you can see, um, the, the, the population that did the worst in terms of simply surviving for 10 years were those that didn't get VNS, didn't get epilepsy surgery, and, and families and community neurologists tried to manage them on medications alone. <clears throat> I want to, I think this slide makes, makes an important point. Um, I, I, I oftentimes will ask, you know, the room, so which of these patients had epilepsy surgery? Um, and it's a bit of a trick question because actually they've all had epilepsy surgery. Um, the one uh, in the upper left-hand corner, I don't know if you guys can see the, the cursor. Um, yep, yeah, you can see the cursor. So this patient has had a very traditional um, uh, resective surgery in which um, about five centimeters of a temporal lobe has been removed. And for many, many years, from about 1950 to the mid-1980s, this was the predominant type of epilepsy surgery. It was a big surgery, required a big craniotomy, bone flap, um, healing time, hospitalization time. Um, this patient had a laser ablation surgery. This is a minimally invasive ablation of a tiny focus of seizure activity here in the left frontal pole, which, um, which most of you may not have even appreciated. This, is, this, this tiny dot here is his, is his uh, surgical cavity. And the last patient had what's called a corticectomy. And even our neuroradiologist would call this, um, this MRI normal, but this patient had the removal of just a tiny sliver of cortex around the left temporal lobe. So the, all these three patients had epilepsy surgery. But as you can see, there are dramatically different volumes, areas, and techniques that were used to remove um, the, the, the brain tissue. Um, on the left is the um, old style, um, the old type of scar, the old type of uh, tr very traditional type of, of uh, 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 imaging findings after a, a, a temporal lobectomy. And on the right side, um, what we see is basically uh, the implantation of a, of a catheter here. That's, this is a less than a two millimeter thick, tiny um, tube down through which a, um, a, a thermal uh, laser um, uh, is, uh, is then inserted. And, um, and then uh, the area of the hippocampus is essentially vaporized and then the catheter is removed. So compare you know, this, this area of tissue that's removed to this very large volume of tissue that's removed. Um, it's probably about 20% um, of the prior, uh, of the traditional forms of epilepsy surgery. In the lower right-hand corner, we see implantation of a, of a device um, called RNS. Um, we probably might have stopped by the Neuropace booth here um, to learn a little bit about RNS, but this is basically a, a <clears throat> defibrillator for seizures in which no brain tissue is affected um, or re removed or um, disconnected. Um, these, this, is, this slide is really intended to show the difference between the diagnostic approaches. So the first slide was really treatment, therapeutic options. Um, in terms of mapping out where seizures were coming from, you know, this was the old style of epilepsy surgery in which a fairly su substantial um, hole is, uh, it has to be created in the bone uh, to set uh, down grids of electrodes. Now I can identify targets on an MRI, these little color dots, or surgeon can implant these um, very thin electrodes um, into those structures, and we can get basically a three-dimensional representation of where does the seizure start, how does the seizure spread. Um, this is what that looks like. I mean, um, from the outside. I mean, each one of these little white caps is the tip of um, of a, a an electrode that goes deep into the into the temporal lobe in this um, in this patient to map out seizures. So this is basically these slides really um, illustrate, I think, the um, transition, uh, the evolution from uh, maximally invasive epilepsy surgery through, that was practiced throughout most of the 20th century and minimally invasive approaches that, that really um, uh, are, are prevalent today uh, in most epilepsy centers. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Dr. Ostendorf to finish off with Tanya. Thanks. 
All right, thank you. Um, so again, when we met Tanya, she was in the ICU and she was having seizures in the ICU and she had had many, many years of seizures. And I think it's easy to look back and, and with a retrospectoscope and say, <clears throat> along the way, her family was uh, definitely impacted by myths and misconceptions of, wow, you know, brain surgery would be dangerous. It would be um, a very large uh, something to go through and she may not recover, she may die. And so that was uh, initially brought up during some of our conversations. <clears throat> and so we talked through that. And then we also looked backwards and said, wow, there were a lot of opportunities where the, the her primary neurologist could have made different decisions about um, about her along the way. And so we decided to, you know, we've captured seizures on her EEG and she was having seizures that were coming from her, her temporal lobe. And when we did an MRI, as we would expect, you know, somebody who has uh, spastic quadriplegia, she had uh, MRI abnormal uh, abnormalities throughout her brain, but she did have hippocampal sclerosis. And so when we talked to the family, we said, you know, let's balance risks and benefits a laser hippocampotomy would be very, very low risk. Um, and because she has mesial temporal sclerosis and because she has these seizures, we might be able to really um, significantly impact her quality of life, even though she may not become seizure free. So taking, talking about a palliative approach. <clears throat> and she went through with the laser hippocampotomy um, uh, as shown by this uh, small, very small catheter going through the hippocampus and into the amygdala, and um, this is sort of post-ablation, so you can see where the tissue has been uh, vaporized, and again, all through a very, very small incision. And this is much better than we had anticipated and counseled on, but she has been seizure-free for three, for now almost four years, and one of the coolest things about this, and I'll never, remember, I'll never forget, you know, mom um, being very tearful uh, when for the first time Tanya started talking and she started saying things like mom and, and having just that bit of communication was a, a, a very large difference in what she had been living through for, for the prior 20 years. Um, so myths and misconceptions about epilepsy surgery really did close the door to Tanya for a long time um, for having a much better outcome and a much better life. and. Um, you know, it, it, now it's our job to go ahead and, and start breaking through those myths. So how do we bust the myths? Um, it's, it, there's no single answer to this, right? We can um, do talks like this, which is a great way to spread the word and to talk more about um, the potential benefits for epilepsy surgery and try to um, educate folks on, on um, the specifics. Um, but, you know, really it needs to go beyond at patient ambassadors through um, programs like the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Alliance, um, having focused information handouts so that we can give the families something tangible to go look at rather than go to Google and hear all kinds of um, potential misinformation, um, develop further partnerships with patient and family organizations. We need to do a much better job of engaging those organizations because they're trustworthy and they reach the families. We can publish guidelines. There are published guidelines, but so it goes beyond just publishing guidelines. We need to reinforce or enforce continuing education on our side of things. Make sure that uh, physicians are keeping up to date with at least the, the recommendations for referrals and treatment. Um, we should get rid of our bias, right? We need to be intentional about um, uh, about bias training to make sure that we're not closing the door prematurely and then uh, better develop bi-directional referral partnerships to make sure that not only the epilepsy centers are focused on this but that we're also partnering with the community neurologists and, and those who aren't at epilepsy centers to make sure that we're sh you know doing a good job communicating and, and um, sending those patients back when we're done with the testing or treatment. Um, so in summary, you know, myths and misconceptions absolutely block the path to, to surgery for some folks who have drug-resistant epilepsy. And doctors and patients' uh, families are uh, both at risk for misinformation. Um, so together we need to um, work together and, and bust the myths of epilepsy surgery. And with that, uh, we'll, we're free to take any questions. So. So how 
does surgery evolve as someone ages? So let's say they've been seizure free for a while and then they hit age 50, would you consider surgery or would that be something? Or would you go back to trying medications again? So um, <clears throat> no surgery for a while, I love seizure free. Seizure free on medications. On medications and then something changes. For many, for many years, yeah. something changes and then seizures return. Um, and so th that situation is absolutely no different from the from the from initial presentation at an earlier age mm -hmm. or initial presentation at a later age. The pre-existence of a long period of well-controlled epilepsy doesn't really change the facts of the case. We would still want to um, make sure that um, there's not a good medication option, right? Seizure-free, no or manageable side effects. Um, and if, and if the, we try a handful of other medications and nothing's working, then we, would, we should and would proceed with the surgical evaluation. Um, so um, yeah, there's, there's no, there's no uh, difference in that case. And then just to be clear, since my understanding of EX is limited, that's almost like a pacemaker just for the brain. Correct. I mean, so we have that we have. I know I'm simplifying. <laughs> no, no, no. But that's, but I, it's a, it's a fair, there, it's an absolutely fair and accurate, um, to some degree, a simplification. We have two predominant um, uh, devices for neuromodulation. One is VNS, which is implanted in the chest wall, tunneled up through the skin, um, and stimulates the vagus nerve, and through the vagus nerve, um, uh, basically disrupts seizure activity. And then we have the RNS, or neuropace device, which is actually implanted in the brain. And the, the, the comparison of a um, pacemaker versus defibrillator is a very, is a valid comparison the, uh, to the VNS and the RNS. So the VNS, is basically is um, is programmed to go off with a certain frequency, certain regularity, certain several um, uh, programmable parameters, but it's not um, it's not waiting, listening for seizures. It's not on demand or responsive um, okay. to brain activity in that way. Um, the newer devices do use um, a change in pulse uh, as a proxy for um, the possible impending seizure may deliver a slightly um, increased current in that mm -hmm. setting, um, but that's quite different from the implant of the RNS device, which is um, watching the actual with electrodes on the seizure onset zone. In most cases, some cases, it, you know, we, we, um, there's some newer developments, but usually the electrodes are on or around the seizure onset zone, watching at all times, waiting for the beginning of a seizure to deliver a uh, current. It's more of a on demand or a responsive um, approach. So, um, and those are, and oftentimes we don't even know whether a patient is is a candidate, whether what the best option is for them until they've gone through um, a diagnostic evaluation. So, um, those may be more than you wanted yeah, to. No, it's good. To, it's actually to, no, but you know, oftentimes, you know, patients will be coming in for uh, their phase one or their phase two, and, and they'll be, yeah, you know, well, what do you think about this, or what do you think about, is, is the RNS, or is the laser, am I a candidate for the laser surgery? And, and, you know, the devil's in the details. We have to get this data first, put it together with all the other bits of information that we have about your situation, and then, you know, and discuss it, and then we'll let you know what we think the best option is. And then a follow-up question, what's the life cycle of the devices? So they last five years, 10 years, do you get, do you need to replace things? So yes, um, VNS is a little bit more dependent on um, the programmed variables. So the duty cycle, the output current, um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, I've seen patients that can go up to 10 years with the VNS. Um, and I've seen patients that required a battery replacement every two and a half to three years, just depending on how what we, how how much we're you you know burning through that 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 um, that battery. Mm -hmm. Now the new RNS device, because uh, that we're now on the second generation of the implanted mm -hmm. RNS device, that has an estimated battery life of eleven years. Oh. Um, so I, 
it's it only came out three years ago I think the new the three twenties yeah yeah about three yeah. years ago so we haven't seen patients hit that mark yet right. because it's relatively new but but we can check the estimated um, the model battery life when we interrogate the device and it looks like that's how long it lasts I have one more can we let another person yeah. ask yeah, 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 sorry, because you had a question as well right Oh, no. No, no, I don't know. Go ahead, put your face in the mic because we're recording. Sure. So people watching this get to hear the questions. Well. Sure. Um, so, my other question is invasiveness. So, when you need to replace batteries and life cycle, is it just like you're starting over again or no? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. It's the, it's the minimalist of, of surgery, it's an outpatient procedure. Um, we do all of our um, we do all of our VNS and uh, I think our RNS battery replacements as, as outpatient procedures. So you um, they don't go into the neck, they don't revise the leads mm -hmm. at all um, for routine battery replacements. So. Well, I have more com a comment because I've been sitting here working through. We've been doing this now for seventeen. My daughter's 18, and we were presented with surgical options six years ago, to which we said no. And so I'm trying to remember what would have changed my mind. And it's more, I was thinking at the time, it was more a lack of information. We were given the option, but when you're presented with, here's another medication we can try, here's a VNS that's an outpatient surgery, there's the corpus callosotomy, which I learned yesterday was actually probably an excellent thing. But when you're given those three choices, and one of them involves a permanent slicing of the brain and not really the data backing it up, why that makes sense, what are you going to choose as a parent? Yeah. And then I'm just thinking onwards in terms of your getting information out there. It sounds like you guys do know more. And what you're doing, this is actually a good moment for getting more of this information out there. On the parent, parent caregiver side, I am on a Facebook group. It's a, the one advantage of being in a really weird epilepsy is that you're in a tiny group of parents who get to know each other mm -hmm. and know, you know who's trustworthy and who's not. And the one dynamic over time that has persisted is that when patients go seizure free, they go back to life. Mm -hmm. So they stop repeating their stories to the point where we tell them, please come back once a year and yeah, give parents yeah. hope. But I'm seriously thinking it would be really good for there to be some permanent place of now, I guess, queuing up to you, where you can just say, mm -hmm. there's new and important good stuff happening, new data, they're still learning for sure, mm -hmm. but go here and continue to ask because as a long-term battle expert now, my peer job has become, go talk to your doctors, mm -hmm. keep asking questions until you're satisfied and don't let it go. And that's kind of, it's become about just training parents how to be their kids advocate and how to talk to you guys because, you know, it's, yeah. th there's all kinds of gaps there that people need to figure out how to do that. And so I'm just telling you, just keep asking, even if you're not sure, even if you think it's done right, just ask. Yeah, those are yeah, those are all all great points. I, I do want to um, say that so actually going to both um, of your comments and questions, there are newer um, position statements advocating for reevaluation because there is this uh, rapidly evolving field number one. We know the brain changes especially in pediatrics. A whole lot and uh, diagnostic options change and so for ex instance the internationally against epilepsy says that okay so you've got drug resistant epilepsy and and you had an evaluation for etiology that should be repeated every, even every two years in order to make sure that okay two years has gone by continued seizures we need to sit back down and reevaluate is there a better test to do now is there a better treatment to offer or do we have better data on an old treatment that we should be talking about? So that's pretty new, and that, to my knowledge, is like the only time that it's come out from a, a sort of governing body that, you no, know, you, we really need to be intentional at every couple years re revisiting 
the testing that's been done and should it be repeated or, or should new testing be done? And then revisiting our conversations with the families and saying, hey, since we last talked about this, this new data has been published and it's been you know, very informative about uh, you know, how it may apply to your, your daughter or, or your family. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm more interested in hearing what you have to say than what I'm I'm just starting to knit together um, stuff that I'm learning from lots of and how. Yeah. And to go to your, your point of the every two years, mm -hmm. the one thing that came through yesterday was that not every place has all the testing equipment that you that to make the very best confident decisions in a world that is gray. Right. I've lived here a long time where I've been on the, you know, so, um, and I'm sitting here wondering, do, does our hospital have that? Do they need to tell the parents so that, I, there's only so much you could do through equipment to ask for more toys, but mm -hmm. families can do something and have, anyway. Good question. I guess it's a question and a comment. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good One more question back here. Yep. Do you want to respond to that? Or? Sure, I, I, I would hesitate to use the word best. Because when I hear the word best, I'm, a, I, I'm thinking one is clearly the better choice between the two. So there are centers with more resources. There are centers with fewer resources. But one of the nice things about NAEC is that it make, it, it's really focused on trying to link centers together that have resources to make sure that if you don't have access to this, you do have a pathway to get that other thing done. And so the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, um, so it, it's the accrediting body. There's 260 epilepsy centers in the United States that are accredited um, at e either the level three or level four. Um, and, and one of the um, sort of conditions of accreditation is that you have a pathway for, if you don't have that at your center, you know who to go to or who you're sending your patients to. And you have a, a, essentially a, a it, it makes sure that you, if you don't have that resource, you do know how to get it for your patient. Um, I had a question. Would you recommend um, surgery for someone who currently has a brain aneurysm and how much of that affect the risk? That's a complicated question. Uh, aneurysms are tough because of size and location, um, family history, etiology for the aneurysm so why is the aneurysm there is it linked to another problem like seizures are they concordant um, so that is a really hard question to answer but many people with epilepsy or without epilepsy do have surgeries for aneurysms but um, that's a really nuanced discussion to have with your treatment team it's a tough one no so that's it. We're out of time today. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.